Welcome everybody um, to our global view on work readiness skills. One of the things that we'd like to emphasize to you is that during this global change um, and in fact global pandemic, the importance of being able to lift your skills, show skills capability uplift and the ways in which that you can make yourself shine in the workplace or the ways in which to get into university or into the workplace itself um, is through employability skills and being able to show that you have communication or teamwork, collaboration, the ability to be able to problem solve and to critically think, and also the ways in which you adapt to what is a very dynamic workplace. So in this day and age, your disciplines, whether you're in construction or engineering, whether you want to be in medicine, science or sports, you have to be able to shine out. So we have a very esteemed panel here today and we'd like to talk with you about the ways in which we can help you upskill within the workplace. Ravneet. Thanks very much, Ash. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to have you all on board with us today. Um, on behalf of Deakin University and my colleagues on the panel, I welcome you all today. Friends, the pace of technology adoption is expected to remain unchanged and may only accelerate. Automation in tandem with the COVID-19 recession is creating double disruption scenarios at workplace and in the education industry. Skill gaps continue to be high and in-demand skills across jobs change in the next five years. The top skills and skill groups, which employers see as rising in prominence in the lead up to 2025, include groups such as critical thinking, analysis, as well as problem solving and skills in self-management, such as active learning, resilience, tolerance, and flexibility. On average, companies estimate that around 40% of workers will require reskilling of six months or less, and 94% of business leaders report that they expect employees to pick up new skills on the job, a sharp uptake from 65 in 2018. The future of work has already changed. Online learning and training is on the rise, but looks different for those in employment and those unemployed. Importance of getting insights from an industry expert to understand the existing skills and the demands in the dynamic corporate world is an absolute necessary. Often deserved certain skill gaps emerge with time that eventually reflect upon an organization's performance as a whole and therefore making skilling training processes even more important to uplift the workforce is an absolute necessity. Deakin Co, a corporate arm of Deakin University, a closely knit conduit between the industry and the academia, highlights how important skilling is and gives tools for improvement to bridge the gap in the skilling area. How Deacon Co uses its network and expertise to design short skilling programs and what programs are on offer will also be discussed today. We will start with our, with our guest of honor who will be talking about uh, the importance of skilling with a very special focus to what's happening in India and how skilling is important. I will then run a panel discussion with my colleague, Ashley, who is the CEO, COO of Deacon Co and Sanjeev. Um, after that, we will have a short presentation on the program, followed by a quiz and a Q&A. I also have with me here Weber, who has actually recently undertaken a program and has some thoughts that he will share at some point of time. So before I sort of introduce Sanjeev, I'd like to say that um, there are people who are entrepreneurs and there are people who are who are, I would say, genius entrepreneurs. And there are people who, you know, you've seen over the years have transformed the Indian economy, the Indian industry, and the Indian corporate. And friends, Sanjeev is one that person. 
Sanjeev Bikchandani is the founder and now the executive chairman of InfoEdge, one of the most dependable internet ventures in India and the owner of Nokri.com. We all know Nokri.com, India's largest job portal. Sanjeev holds a postgraduate diploma in management and entrepreneurship from the prestigious Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. He was awarded the Padma Shri, which is the fourth highest civilian award in India in January 2020. He has extensive knowledge about the Indian industry, actually drives the Indian industry, and is leading several academic in initiatives which are relevant to the now and the future of both education and work. Sanjeev, I request you to share your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Ravneet, uh, and thank you for inviting me here. And um, a big hi to all, every who's viewing, who's listening. And uh, thank you, Ashley, Devav, Kaushik, Kushmit, David. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so I won't speak for long, just make a few points in about 10 minutes. So I want to, you know, I am 57 years old. I began my career when I was 21, straight out of college. Uh, this is 1984. I was in my first job. Now, if I look back to 1984, and I, you know, and I uh, see the scenario today. Here's one fact. So many of the industries that are creating jobs today and have the buzz today simply did not exist in India in 1984. Right? So the IT services industry did not exist. The IT enabled services industry did not exist. Organized modern retail did not exist. E-commerce did not exist. Private sector insurance did not exist. Uh, private sector commercial banking did not exist. Investment banking did not exist. Uh, venture capital priority did not exist. So you look at any industry that you know is really desirable today as a you know as a as a place of work. Chances are it did not exist 25 years ago in this country. Now, what does this mean? So people ask me, what's the next big thing? And I say, I don't know. Because quite honestly, if in 1984 you would ask me, what will the world be like uh, when you're in your mid-50s? I would never have predicted this. Right? Uh, just to give the youngsters here an example, in 1984, there was an eight-year waiting list to get a land line, a land telephone line. There was no mobile telephone, eight-year waiting list. In 1984, there was an eight-year waiting list to get a gas cylinder, right? In 1984, there was a 17 year waiting list to buy a scooter, a two wheeler. All these motorcycles did not exist, right? So the point I'm making is that next, you know, you've got to plan for 30 years, 35 years, right? Uh, most of us, I, I would imagine on this call are, are young, are in their twenties, right? So you have to plan for 30, 35 years, right? And there's some plan you got to do for this quarter, some plan for this year, some plan for next year, but then some long-term plan for 35 years. Because let me tell you, if this is what happened 35 years ago, or since the last 35 years, believe me, something similar will happen in the next 35 years. Right? There will be change. There will be new industries being bought, old ones will die. There will be new jobs being created. Technology will evolve, technology will change. And we don't know what will happen. So how do you prepare yourselves for the next 35 years of a career? Okay. Uh, what knowledge, what skills, what attitude? I think the first, I think let's start with attitude. I think the first thing is you need an attitude that enables you to be an, a lifetime learner. Because as the environment changes, technology changes, industry changes, jobs change job content changes, job requirements change, right? You will have to keep on learning. So first is lifetime learning. So never ever believe you know it all because you never know it all. In fact, you know very little. I know even now I'm 57, I still know very little. Right? So lifetime learning, humility and respect for other people because most work is done in teams. So if you approach your job and your career with this, with this uh, attitude. I think that's a good foundation. Now we come to you know 
some skills. So some skills are lifelong skills. They are foundational skills. They are skills which will never go out of fashion. They are skills which will never be redundant. These are skills like communication skills, whether oral or writing, right? Uh, sure, technology has changed and therefore you may have to maybe modify your communication a bit. Now, there was no email when I started my work. There was no internet, there was no email. There were no computers on, on, on desks. We had manual typewriters. We sent handwritten memos, right? Uh, but I still had to communicate, right? Uh, now, you communicate on WhatsApp, that's, I don't know how many, you know, that's telegraphic English, whatever it is. I do not know what it is, but it's still got to communicate, right? Uh, so communication skills, I think uh, most jobs are uh, done in teams with, in pe with people in collaboration, right? And, uh, you know, uh, when I began my career, there wasn't so much cross-cultural or cross-geography collaboration. You know, you wouldn't work with uh, somebody in Australia, somebody in the US and somebody in the, in the UK being in the same team. So that's an added thing, uh, you know, cultural sensitivity. But it's an added thing. You, the fundamental thing is you got to work with people. Now to work with people, you've got to, uh, you know, soft skills are really important, right? And I think Deakin has got a good program on soft skills. It's got a good program on communication. And, you know, and, and this is, these are lifelong, lifelong skills, lifelong abilities, right? Uh, I think numeracy skills are important because a lot of the work you do will be some element of numbers, right? So numeracy skills are important, right? And then, so there are foundational skills, a set of, and then there are current skills. So you start by doing foundational skills, and side by side, you also pick up one or two current skills. The current skills are likely to get you a job today. The foundational skills are likely to keep you in your job doing well, because you're good at communication, because you're good with people, because you're good with numbers. And hopefully you'll get your next better job, right? Uh, but the current skills, you've got to figure out from the market, right? What are the current skills I should be focusing on, depending on your ability and your interest and the opportunities out there, right? Now, it could be analytics. We were discussing it, you know, among ourselves, uh, you know. But for analytics, you've got to be really good at numbers and math. And if you're not good at that, Right? Maybe that's not your cup of tea. Is it social media marketing? Is it search engine optimization? Okay, is it, you know, what is the current skill? So I would say foundational skills and then focus on acquiring one or two narrow vertical skills and become really good at those one or two vertical skills. And that will get you a job immediately. So foundational skills for lifelong, two narrow vertical skills for immediate job, right? Something you're interested in, something you can be good at, something where there, where there are opportunities. Uh, today in COVID era, I mean, it's a good idea to have a skill where you can work remotely, where you don't have to go to office and you can still deliver, right? But all in all, I'd say uh, all of us should invest in ourselves. Invest in our careers, invest in our development, because that's how we will get the opportunities that are available. And believe me, even in the COVID time, in the COVID era, you know, right now there are opportunities. Right? It's just that you got to develop a talent for which there's a market. Yeah, I'll stop here. We can discuss more in uh, the panel discussion. But thank you so much for listening to me. Thanks. Thanks, Sanjeev. And, um, you know, I totally agree with you that in, in life, uh, you know, skills, um, knowledge go hand in hand. But in times um, like this, definitely uh, upskilling becomes a very, very important part of where your future career is and what you do in your life. And uh, lifelong learning um, is, is a very important part of our life. Um, I'm just going to get you both... Um, uh, you know, to have a bit of a oh, chat. Sorry, uh, may I just add something there to what you sure. said? See, lifelong sure. learning. You see, the point is that if you're, if you're a lifelong learner, so today's narrow vertical skill may no longer be so relevant tomorrow. That's right. But if you pick up a second or third vertical skill by then, which is relevant then, you will still be current. 
Yeah. So yeah. the important thing is stay current and relevant yeah. by continuously picking up skills yeah. through your career, which are relevant, but based on the foundation of the foundational skills that I mentioned. That's right. Yeah. So I think your point about absolutely, Sanjeev, your point about how important you can, um, you know, your, your primary and your secondary <laughs> skills will interchange in due course of time. But the foundational skills always remain and give you that base and that age. Absolutely. So uh, let me ask you a question, um, um, Sanjeev, with, with your vast experience and with both employers and the workforce, um, what do you think are the top essential skills? You did mention a few, which you talked about attitude, lifelong learning, humility, respect, teamwork. But um, you know, if, if the youngsters are listening to you and you were to hire somebody, what are the five things you would look for in a person? So it depends on the role I'm looking at. Okay. But I think uh, people's skills, ability to work with in a team, uh, you know, are you the kind of person whom people want to work with? Can you add value to a team? Are you constantly getting into fights? Uh, you know, what kind of guy are you? What kind of person are you? Uh, I think uh, that becomes important. Uh, so let's say there's a narrow vertical technical job, highly specific. Let's say it's a software engineer in this specific uh, platform. And you're typically working alone, let's say, to start with. Right? You can ignore the people skill element as long as you're really good at programming. You know, uh, you know, some of us might. But the moment you know, you're in a team of five, six people, the moment you're leading a team of three, four people, you better be very good at with your people skills as well. Mm. So you can get a start with our people skills if you've got good technical skills. But to move ahead, you need good people skills. So I will look at people skills uh, alongside technical skills if it's a technical job, both. Now, if it's a non-technical job, let's say it's a sales job. Yeah. Or it's a, you know, and, or, it's a, or it's a servicing job, or it's a, you know, a customer, client servicing job. You really need good people skills and good communication skills. So most of us who are generalists, you know, who did not, who did not possess a technical qualification, we're looking for a job on that platform that we studied, right? You really need people skills from the, from the get-go. Mm. So if I look at my company, we have four and a half thousand people, roughly 800 are in engineering, but 2,000 or two and a half thousand are customer facing. Now for the customer facing guys, people skills are really important. Mm. For the engineering guys, the technology guys, uh, you know, people skills become important the moment you are part of a team of four or five people, or you are leading a team. Mm. So if you want to get ahead, you definitely, definitely need great people skills. Mm. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Ash, what's the, what's the global scenario? I mean, is it any different than what you see in conversations with corporations, um, and and? What's happening in Australia in particular in this space? Sure. Look, I mean, it resonates with everything that Sanjeev has said. You know, the employability skills, the communication, teamwork, being able to work with people is primary, whether it's within finance or retail or indeed in engineering. You know, in, we um, conducted a report with um, KPMG and we showed that you can add 10% to your salary if you can prove your people skills. Um, because the ability to be able to communicate well, whether it's in a technical or non-technical environment, is absolutely paramount to be able to make yourself stand out. Similarly, self-management is absolutely huge. Can Do you have the ability to be given a task and to finish it? on time and within budget and to be able to prove value to a company. Um, and the other ones are digital literacy and financial literacy, an ability to be able to understand the budget and how you fit into it and how you can actually add value to um, an organization. And the top skill of all that's showing across 10 verticals at the moment is customer experience. That ability to be able to service customers, that front facing role that Sanjeev is talking about. So I think across the globe, the same employability skills are required by everybody. Yeah. Um, Sanjeev, what do you think is the impact of COVID 19, um, you know, to people who 
perhaps would be just getting into the workforce or even who are in, um, you know, getting into universities like Weber is here, just getting into education. What do you think is the impact? Yeah, look, of it's, uh, so we also, uh, I'm involved at Ashoka University as a founder. And so I know, you know, both at the student level and at the, uh, you know, at, at the employment level, entry level, employment level, what it's like. And uh, look, it's, these are tough times. Right, people joined university with a certain expectation, and uh, many times now, given the state of the employment market for for freshers, uh, it's it's slightly different from what they had hoped for, uh, anticipated. Uh, even those joining college, it's very different because uh, right now classes are remote in most places, so that campus experience is not there. That cohort, that you know, I'm with people, I'm having fun, I'm studying, but I'm also having fun. I'm in a I'm in a hostel, I'm in a residence, and you know. Uh, you know, I'm independent, uh, you know, and uh, there's also fear of COVID. So look at stuff, right? But, but look at it this way, you know, uh, I, I'm willing to bet five years from now, you all will be, it'll, it'll, it'll be bragging rights, right? That, you know, I came through this. And you look back on it, each experience is different, right? And now, if I look back on my career of 35 years, Right, so you know there are enough war wounds, right? Uh, there was the 1990 recession, there was a 96 recession, there was a 2000 global meltdown, there was a 2008-9 global financial crisis, there was a 2015 slowdown, right? We came through it. So this too shall pass, but be sensible, be safe, and it'll be all right. Uh, you know, if you are just passing out of college. Uh, and you haven't been able to get a job because the placement market is bad, right? That's the reality. But I would say get some work experience, become a free intern somewhere, add something to your biodata, do a course, utilize this time well. Uh, be an intern, work from home, you know, work free, whatever. Write a book or write something, right? Uh, you, you know, uh, don't waste this time. Yeah, so I find, Sanjeev, I find a lot of the people, you know, who have had plans to maybe go overseas for higher education, uh, you know, are deferring their plans um, because they want to not study online, but uh, they want to study on campus. And I am not sure how efficiently they use their time between now and when they actually can get on campus. Now, it could be sometimes next year or it could be sometimes later next year. We don't know. But... How do you tell these students that, you know, what you need to do between now and then is continuous effort to upgrade yourself in... Oh, it's kind of hard, knowledge. right? See, uh, in India especially, uh, you know, uh, we study not because we want to study. Uh, very often in school, we study because we have to study. We are made to study, right? There's this whole jail theory of school, which is if you go to school for five and a half hours and you're in a classroom and the teacher gives you homework, you do the homework, the teacher gives you a test to prepare for the test, right? So you're not, so 95% of students are not self-driven. And I was in that 95%. I was not self-driven, right, to study. And that's normal. But these are not normal times. So my only advice is, look, even if you are not, you know, you find it hard to sort of push yourself to study alone. Because, you know, online learning very often is you and your computer and, you know, it's remote learning. And yeah, there are people in the cohort, but they are you know, seeing them as, you know, as, as squares on your, on, your, on, your, on your computer screen, right? Uh, you're not really meeting them. You're not socializing with them. So, so very often, see, school and college are a social experience, apart from an academic experience. So left to yourself on your own, you would rather, you know, watch YouTube, you would rather, you know... Uh, be, be, be on a social media site, be on Facebook, be on Twitter, be on, uh, you know, and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, but this is the time when you've got to rise to the challenge and give some hours a day. Right. And one way to do it is to do an online course, which, you know, gives you skills, knowledge, something. Because an online course typically has got <laughs> assignments, it's got submissions, it's got a schedule. Uh, so, it helps rather than doing it completely on your own. Mm. Mm. Um, Ash, 
Deacon Co. provides products and solutions for um, readiness, work readiness, professional readiness, whatever we call it, uh, which both builds measures and workplace uh, and actually looks at workplace capability. Can you highlight and tell us how do you think this is going to be an important part of um, the gap that's, that exists in the skilling sector and what Deacon Co. Really, what's its, uh, what's its ethos? You know, what, where does it come from? What's the bottom line of Deacon Co? Okay, so the bottom line of Deacon Co is to actually empower people to be able to move in the workforce, to be able to ensure that they actually have that leg up to be able to through practical online learning that is modularized. So, you know, the idea is that to Sanji's point, you don't sit and slave in front of the computer for hours upon hours. You can choose a module, say in communications, enhancing your communication skills, and you can do an hour with some interactivity and some work online. Um, there are cohorts that you can engage with. Um, and then you can actually really look at ways in which you want to particularly upskill yourself. So those areas that we've all talked about, the communications, teamwork, um, customer experience, data-driven marketing, you know, the SEO um, example Sanjeev gave, um, things that you really are interested in that you can actually prove capability. This really is a time that there's some really exciting interactive online courses that are available and it actually really helps you to develop yourself as a person, an individual to be able to hit the market. Because even wanting to go to university, the question is going to be how much of an individual were you to actually try and develop yourself so that you actually could cope with both the courses that you want to do, but also, you know, if you're going to go and study internationally, you're going to want to find a job in Australia. You're going to want to work in retail or whatever to be able to support yourself while you're studying. So to be able to say, I took a course in communications or in customer experience, and I can prove to you that I know the types of environments in which I'm going to be working and the ways in which I've developed myself to be able to hit the ground running when I hit whichever country I'm going to, it seems to be a very smart use of time at the moment. Sure, sure. Um, I guess, and sorry, I add to that, Revni, that all of our courses have been built in alignment with industry. There's not one course that we've written that doesn't have a subject matter expert from um, the industry in which it's aligned that has ensured that they really hit the mark as to what employers want. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for that, Ash. Um, Sanjeev, um, just um, in closing, I'd like to sort of uh, in, on the panel, but then um, I'll just, uh, you know, uh, hop on to the presentation in a bit. Um, what do you, what is the right time to upskill yourself? Like, should it be in school? Should it be in college? Should it be continuous? Um, you know, people feel, oh, I'm just in school and I don't want to um, uh, skilled right now. And I want to maybe wait till I get into college or maybe when I get into workforce. So when do you think, I think is the right I time? I think it's uh, always the right time. You know? So uh, what's the right time to fall in love with me? Okay. <laughs> I mean, so I'll tell you. Uh, my first attempt at skilling myself was uh, after my class 10 uh, board exam. We had a uh, we were switching over from the Jan December system to the uh, April system, so I had uh, three or four months uh, vacation, right? And uh, after after grade ten, and this is uh, 1978, uh, 77, uh, 78, 78 end, right? Uh, and in those days, manual typewriters were used everywhere, right? So there used to be these typing schools in every neighborhood market. There'd be at least one or two typing schools where there would be, you know, maybe 20, 30 typewriters put there, table put there, and they give you some lesson to practice, and you practice the quick fox jumps over the lazy brown dog, right? And in my enthusiasm, I told my father, why don't I learn typing? So my father said, great, go. So I was paying some 100 rupees a month to do one hour of typing, and I did that for two months. Mm. Now, I didn't get a job because of that, and I wasn't mm. looking for a job. Mm. But the point was that I felt it was useful to learn something which is practical. And, and which could, I, I wasn't going and to- And has it helped you? Has it helped you? So look, I'm still not a four finger typer. 
Okay, but I type pretty fast. I'm okay. So you know, I'm, and you know, the, the thing about typing then was, right? Can you look away and type and get it right? You know, because you're reading something and you're typing. If you could do that, right? And you were a four finger typer, typist, then you were really proficient. Now that takes I don't know, one to two years to reach that level. So I only did two months. So I had to look and type at the keyboard. But now increasingly, I find that I don't have to look. I have, or I have to look less. I, I know where the key is. So you're getting better at it. Well, over the years, <laughs> <laughs> I've still learning. <laughs> I've still learning. No, but you see, uh, so I'll tell you. So uh, a simple thing. Uh, so when computers first came into companies in India in the 80s, right? They were really expensive, personal computers. So you would have a air conditioned room where there'd be a computer, it'll be shared, it'll be, you know, there'll be a dust jacket on it, plastic. You would take off your shoes and go into that room. You didn't, because it was dust would damage the, the PC. And there would be a register and you'd book time slots. On it. So I've got computer time at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., whatever, you know, because there were 200 people sharing one computer, right? This is in 84, 85, right? Uh, now, when I got my second job in 89, uh, all the other people are older. They didn't know how to use a PC, right? So you had a kickstart to that, yeah. So I became this guy, the go-to guy. Yeah. That there was one PC in the whole department. Yeah. And he had, you know, why didn't you do this for me? You know, in those days, there was no PowerPoint. There was something called Harvard Graphics as a presentation software. Some of the older people might remember. Uh, and I was a king on Howard graphics. I could do spreadsheet, Howard graphics, you know, I could uh, word processing. Others didn't know it. Then slowly, the senior people's secretaries moved from electronic typewriter to a PC and they learned word processing from me. Fantastic. Uh, I had a skill. I was a go-to guy. If I didn't have the skill, you know, I was just another guy. Fantastic. Now, so you make a very good point, Sanjeev, about <clears throat> there is no right time to skill. Every time is the right time. Every stage of your life, whether you are 20, 40, 60, um, there is no time gap to learn or to upskill or to study. Um, and also my father-in-law at 92 learned how to use a, an iPad, a computer, and he communicated with his grandchildren all over the world um, when he learned that skill um, in, at 92. So I guess it's a question of how do you optimize on this and how do you learn from this? And, and at the end of the day, how do you use it to the best of your ability and the best of your knowledge? Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna just talk <clears throat> a little about um, the programs on offer, uh, and then we can take any questions um, after a quick um, uh, uh, quiz. So um, Kasha, can I have the next slide? <clears throat> Um, so Deakin University, uh, corporate arm of Deakin um, University is Deakin Co. Um, we are a workplace capability and transformation specialist. Um, we, uh, we work together with industry and academia, uh, positioned as a leader in quality, pragmatic digital delivery uh, at a competitive price, backed by um, Deakin University, which is in the top 1% of the world universities. Thriving in the new normal is a very important part of what we do next, um, uh, friends, and it is really, really important uh, on looking at how we increase virtual interactions, what is the new normal, what is a greater demand for digital service, blended work arrangements, maintaining a leadership presence, um, and also how, what are the organizations looking for in the near future? It's important to look at programs that are short skilling um, upgradation programs. The skill enhancement is an important part of what we need to do. Um, covering contemporary topics and emerging fields, the flexible self-paced online work is uh, work and skills is a very important part. So the courses on offer at uh, that Deacon co-offer, which are completely digital um, are, uh, you know, mentioned in, in the screen that you can see. There are two levels. One is a foundation level and one is a proficient level. This is for working professionals. Um, and this program is uh, data-driven marketing, digital literacy, teamwork, critical thinking, innovation, financial literacy, communication, and customer service. I think my colleagues, Ash and, and Sanjeev mentioned all of this. And this was not doctored, so I can tell you, this was just uh, impromptu that Sanjeev was talking about. But 
we captured his mind and we've got most of these, um, these skills mentioned here in the programs that we offer. The foundation programs um, that we offer is also for um, students uh, who have just graduated or in their final year of graduation. Um, and, and proficient is for people who've just got into the workforce. So you can see that there is a list of these programs that are available. <clears throat> Each of these modules can be completed in four to six hours of work. Uh, they're 100% online. Um, they um, are recognized through a certification and validate your skills with a professional practice credential. And they, are, they have been designed in consultation with industry. What are the benefits? The benefits really is that you do uh, bridge the gap between your current skill and the next level of the skill. Uh, you're building a skill set of capability that Sanjeev was mentioning important to do um, every day of your life. Um, you create a professional profile. I see a question from a, from a student uh, who's I think in final year saying that I don't have any professional experience. What do I put in my CV and how do I actually present myself even for the first internship? Well, I think that if you are somebody who possesses the right kind of skills that the corporate is looking for, um, you may not necessarily need a starting point of any experience to get into an internship, especially if it's an unpaid internship. So the attitude, the aptitude and the skill is the important part. I think it's- yeah, uh, Ravni, Ravni, yeah. sorry, may I, may I add? Please do, please do, please do. So look, I'll tell you something. Uh, in very many organizations, people who decide things are old, 35, 40, 45 years older, okay? The, the senior guys. And these guys are totally clueless on new media, on, on uh, you know, uh, uh, Facebook, on, uh, you know, Instagram, on, uh, on other stuff, right? And increasingly, however, the customers are young people. So you have old people deciding who don't know the media so well, where the customers are. And this is where young people can fit in easily. If you can, you know, uh, understand social media very well, I mean, people will you will people will hire you because you you know communication and social media for the company for the brand. I think this is really important. Just just yeah. just a thought of yeah. what skill you know uh, that Rodney is talking about. Yeah, yeah, and Sanjeev, you know, um, like I'll tell you with with Deakin's experience um, at Deakin University, we focused a lot on um, you know talking to institutions, working with institutions, and and um, and getting uh, students to understand our offerings. Uh, through our institutional partnership and agency network. But now, at this point of time, we've just hired um, a digital um, marketing manager, you know, because we feel that we need to correct and connect to the core market, which is the, um, the student out there who is digitally savvy and yes. connects with the world in a digital manner. Uh, you know, we, so, and it has to be custom made to the requirement. You can't run that from Australia because you have to understand the mindset and, and the local um, or the social norms uh, as well. Um, and, and, and coming to your point about how things change and how important jobs arise. Um, so that's a great new area. And Kaushik, if we just go back to <coughs> the slide that we talked about on the courses, if you look at this one, data-driven marketing actually is a very, very interesting and a very important um, skill set that uh, people in today's world looking for jobs should definitely build up. I think innovation is the other, unless and until you, you, um, you innovate in what you're doing, um, you know, you are not necessarily sought after. Um, and, and I think that's an important part of uh, uh, how you upskill and what you upskill in. Yeah, let's move on. <clears throat> I think I've talked about this. Um, the pricing, my friends, is very, very nominal. We, I wanted to share the pricing in today's presentation because it is an important part for decision making, especially with the economic situation right now. Um, the student level program, a, a set of four courses is priced at 13,000 Indian rupees. Um, student may opt to enroll in a single unit or in two units as well. A profession program is priced at 15,000 and the students could enroll in single courses as well. So um, these are very, very Indian pricing, as we say, you know, to the Indian market and the same internationally is three times or four times more. 
Um, and, and the whole idea really is uh, to work with you and make sure that we are able to add value while you're sitting in the comfort of your home uh, and necessarily not starting college or in college, but not necessarily going on campus. And you have the time to bridge that gap between your time frame and start to pick up skills that are going to help you not just now in the next two years, but in your next stage of your careers as you move up into your career ladder. Yeah. <clears throat> I think I've talked about this. There are also master classes within the programs that are run by industry experts, which are synchronous, and that gets embedded into the program. And there are digital badges that you will get where you can also, those of you who are just starting out can create LinkedIn profile and digital profile so that that's a starting point for you in your career sector. Um, so if you need to know more and get more information, you go on to deaconincoindia.com um, and, and you can get more information and you can interact with staff uh, going from there. Um, just before we close, I'd like to bring in Weber here at this point of time. Weber, you've done the professional readiness program um, you know, where you did four units, didn't you? No, ma'am, I did three of the units. Okay, which ones did you do, Weber? Uh, yeah, they were named Digital Fundamentals in a Connected World, From Logical to Critical Thinking and Fundamentals of Communication. Okay, and uh, what made you decide on taking up the program? Ma'am, actually, uh, there was a gap between my colleges and after the school. So uh, I am a student of EduPlanet Ludhiana. So the sir told me to enroll myself into the courses so that they might help me in the future after my degree and all in the workplace. What was your experience? Ma'am, the experience was great. The courses were really interactive and the theoretical material, the videos and the articles, they were very engaging and easy to understand. And the best thing about these courses, in my opinion, was that they were self-paced. You can do them whenever and wherever you want. And uh, the educators also responded to all the reflective answers that I gave, which in my understanding is the best way so that I can understand uh, the concept more deeply and where I was wrong. The case studies and the activities were real fun to do. And uh, they also helped me to recognize the extent of my understanding of that particular module after its completion. So what are your future career plans and how do you think this will be helpful to you? Um, actually, I'm planning to uh, get my bachelor's in artificial intelligence from Deakin University itself. So I think that uh, when I will be uh, an artificial intelligence uh, engineer, uh, as I will be in a team, uh, these skills helped me a lot because uh, they were a uh, real small things that I ignored before while I was doing the courses. But when, when I went through them, uh, I realized that these small things that I ignored had a real impact in uh, these team meetings and all. Okay. All right. Um, thanks very much. I know there'll be lots of questions that will come up. Uh, if we have time, we'll try and take up one or two. But before that, there is um, a quiz, poll quiz question coming up on the screen. Uh, please answer the question. Um, and there is uh, an announcement of a complimentary enrollment for the winner um, in one program. So the first one is how many enrollment levels are available? If you were listening to me at all, you would know this answer. <laughs> <clears throat> the second one is what is the mode of program delivery? And the third one is how many courses make a cluster? Okay, all right. So while my team gets on to uh, get the answer, um, I have a I have some time to very quickly pick up uh, some questions. Uh, I can see some questions there. Um, Sanjeev, there is a question um, uh, which says uh, that currently I'm studying, this is anonymous, uh, studying nutrition and dietetics. And I've always ha I have an aim to become a healthcare professional. So I want to do an MBA in healthcare in future. How can I become an entrepreneur in healthcare sector? Uh so look, uh, my submission to all aspiring entrepreneurs is that uh, it's useful to work somewhere for a couple of years, for three, four, five years at least. You know, you uh, learn the ropes, learn the integrity, understand what it's like to operate as a uh, in an organization. Uh, of course, there are very many examples of people who didn't work anywhere and still did a company and succeeded. But I found it very useful to work uh, for three years or five, five years. I worked for five years before I started my, my company. 
um, it's useful to pick up best practices from somewhere else. It's also useful to be in touch with customers. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, I'd say you should, your first job should be somewhere where, uh, you know, you are either making something or selling something. Right? So either you're producing or you're selling. Hmm. Uh, and perhaps both. Right? And then uh, that's when you really pick up uh, the re relevant skills, the relevant for, 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 for that sector. Right? Uh, now, you can do an MBA in, uh, um, you know, and, and, and become a healthcare professional. That's more healthcare management uh, as opposed to you know, actually doing the operations of healthcare. But yeah, it can be useful. I know enough people who've done it. Right? Uh, and maybe an MBA will hold you in good stead, you know, after 10 or 15 years, when you rise up the organization or have a larger organization reporting to you, and you need all those management skills and knowledge that you learned in your MBA, right? So I would say, look, complete your, complete your undergrad, right? Uh, and do it really well. Study hard, uh, you know, get good grades. The better grades you get, the higher chance you have of getting uh, into a good business school, right? You must demonstrate academic commitment. Also try and get some practical experience so you know what the real world is like. Right? And that's what I would recommend. So right now, focus. Focus, don't think too far ahead. Focus, do well in your undergrad. Uh, maybe work for a couple of years, then do your MBA or maybe do your MBA straight. Uh, and if you work, uh, you know, work in the healthcare sector in, in, a, in a role where you're either producing something or you're selling something. Um, there's another question, uh, Sanjeev and Ash, feel free to answer this, that if somebody is studying a degree in artificial intelligence or a degree uh, which is a technical degree, but due to the current situation, they may not then get an internship or work in that particular area, um, but they, they get work in another area. Is that okay to, that, I mean, when an employer looks at them uh, with their skill set, uh, your experience is in a completely uh, different industry. Your education is in a different industry. So I think it's important to, um, uh, Sanjeev, it's important yeah. to- Yeah, so look, uh, look to the specific case of AI. Now, if you are smart and bright and you've done a rigorous AI course from a good place, a well-reputed place, right? You don't have to switch fields. You will get a job because that's in serious demand, right? Uh, but AI requires uh, some, you know, significant prowess. Uh, in all associated skills, uh, notably maths, right? And so you, uh, to get a job in AI is not easy, uh, but if you're good at it, you'll get a job easily. You don't have so to change. And if yeah. you've got good communications, you'll also rise to the top because you can do the maths and the analytics, but you can also explain to your audience what it is that you're achieving for them and the, and the exactly. outcomes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so so, so that specific skill, you know, uh, you don't have to switch fields if you're going to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I guess uh, we, we are coming to a very close end of our discussion. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add on from here? There are lots of questions that are coming in. We'll send the answers to these questions on email. Um, but um, I want to know how Mr. Sanjeev started Nokri.com. Somebody wants to know that. Okay, very quickly. It's been fairly well documented. So, uh, you know, uh, so I'll tell you. Uh, so here's one insight on entrepreneurship, which you can carry with you. Uh, successful businesses are built on deep customer insights. Right? Just remember this. So are you in touch with your customers? Do you have insights? Right? So when I was in my last job in company that is now called GlaxoSmithKline, I was in marketing and I was working on the brand Holix. There were eight or 10 of us sitting in an open hall, right? And I used to observe everyone and I noticed that when the office copy of Business India came in, uh, it's a fortnightly magazine, when the office copy came in, everybody would read it from the back, right? Uh, because there were 35 to 40 pages of appointment ads in the back of the magazine. And I used to find this strange behavior. I said, look, this is a magazine. People should be reading articles, but they're spending all their time looking at, at job ads. And they're working for a good company in a good job. And, uh, you know, they're not going to leave. But they're still looking at jobs. And then they would start discussing. Hey, there's this job going here. What do you think? You know, and it never applied because they're actually quite happy in the jobs. And, and that gave me a customer insight that jobs are a high interest category of information. Seven years later, 
I didn't want to do this insight. Seven years later, when I saw the internet for the first time, I said, hey, let's just take all the newspapers and magazines from around the country and re rehash the jobs into our own words and put them up on the net and see what happens. So I used to get 29 newspapers and magazines from around the country into my office, right? And I would put up the job ads. And the moment we did that, the traffic began to come because jobs are a high interest category of information. And you know, if the, the job, the ad appeared in the newspaper today, one week later it's gone, right? You, you don't have last week's newspaper, but you can still go to this website and see the last 30 days of job ads. Right, so we began to get traffic. And that's how Nokri started. It started from observing the customer. Which is why I say either make something or sell something. Because if you're selling something, you're in touch with the customer. Yeah. Absolutely correct. And um, thank you, Sanjeev. And I, I actually don't want to end this session, but I'm enjoying it myself so much that maybe we'll do it again. Um, maybe we'll get your time again. And we can even, no offer, you an, we can even offer you a nice coffee. Um, maybe we can do that once things get better or, yeah. or we will get you online again to speak because there are, I'm, I, I can see there are questions flowing in um, about, uh, you know, your experience and Ash about your experience at a, you know, sort of a um, global level with, uh, you know, what's happening around the world as well. And I think with Sanjeev's global experience and Indian specific uh, entrepreneurial experience, I think it's, a, it's an absolute value addition to our listeners. Um, and thank you so much, everyone. And the winner um, for the quiz is Alina Saji. Uh, congratulations, Anila. Uh, the office will be in touch with you um, and you could enroll in a program uh, complimentary from Deakin University. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's been, a, it's been an absolute pleasure to interact with you, Sanjeev. Uh, I've enjoyed the conversation thoroughly. Um, and thank you, Ash. It's been a pleasure to have you and sorry to make you work uh, evening your time from Australia. Um, thank you, Weber, for your thoughts and comments, and thank you to my team for putting this together. Uh, thank you to all the participants for coming on board on a sa Saturday morning still. Um, it's been a lovely conversation. Good luck, and thank you very much. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you, Mr. Uh, thanks, Ravdeep. Uh, thanks, Ash. Bye, Weber. Take Bye. care, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.